God from hand praise
praise the Lord. Amen. They're coming out.
as that rugged cross stood on Golgotha's hill and our Savior hang there from the sixth to the ninth hour in pain and in agony. He wasn't silent. He wasn't angry. His heart was not filled with retribution, getting e even with anybody. But he just hanged there. And the very first words he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Deacon John Saunders is coming. Praise the Lord. Precious Father God, I stand before your people tonight, Lord God, and I ask, Lord, that you will let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, thy strength and thy redeemer. And the church said, Amen. First, giving honor to God, who is the head of my life, my redeemer, my everything. I'd also like to honor my pastor, the wonderful bishop, Norman Odell Harper. And of course, his wife for life, my first lady, my evangelist, Arabella Harper. I'd like to Welcome, of course, today all of the elders, ministers, missionaries, all of God's people, everyone that is within my voice, and even those online. And I would be remiss if I didn't speak to the one who snatched me from my days of thinking I was a ladies' man, that now I am this ladies' man, Mary Andrew Saunders, the ham hock in my collard greens. Today's scripture was going to come to you from Matthew 12 and 19. And it reads, he shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. Saints, today, this story starts on a Palm Sunday. Many, many years ago, Jesus left the city of Jericho to go to Bethpage, then on to Jerusalem. And as Jesus rode a donkey into the town of Jerusalem, he was met by a large and cheering crowd. They were all excited and abuzz with the anticipation of his arrival. Don't we get excited when we know that Jesus is coming around? Yes, we do. And they hailed him as the Messiah. Hosanna, son of David, they shouted. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Behold, your king is here. He was the rightful king. Now this was a true celebration, not some kind of publicity stunt. This was no ancient version of this present day Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. No pomp no circumstance. It was the king asserting his authority over the kingdom. Now, fast forward some days later, Jesus is now being led through the same streets. But something strange happens in our text. It's the same city of Jerusalem, but now there's people shouting, 
crucify him. Crucify him. Oh, my. Some of these people days earlier hailed him. Over these days, Jesus was betrayed, tried, imprisoned, and convicted. In this crowd now are horrible and hateful people. And mixed in the crowd are priests, fellow elders, scribes, and Pharisees with their minds and hearts set on making sure that a terrible carnage would take place. Now the soldiers were leading Jesus through these same streets while he was being savagely beaten, punched, spat on, beard pulled out, oh my, kicked, Hit with a vicious whip, a cat of nine lives, and cursed at. But he didn't mumble a word. He didn't say a word. I want to tell you today that on Matthew 12, it says, which was my verse that he shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice, because Jesus didn't want to battle against the opposition. He didn't even cry to show tears of emotion or give subjection to his enemies or raise his voice in these streets because he could have caused a mob or rebellion with the spirit to take hold of the people to defend him against his enemies. Jesus wanted to go to his divine destiny. So I say to you today that as they led Jesus, he was being followed by Simon of Cyrene. After he was compelled by soldiers to carry Jesus' cross. He came as part of the celebration and they pulled him in as part of this terrible horrible situation going on they were led to a place outside of the city called Golgotha which being interpreted meant the place of the skull this place refers to a traditional story that Adam was buried there and his skull was found there. Hence, they called this place the skull, Calvaria, Calvary. As Jesus arrived with Simon of Cyrene, four soldiers awaited him. The time was 9 a.m. And these soldiers nailed Jesus to the cross. That was their duty to wait and nail him to the cross. Now, when they raised his broken, battered, and unrecognizable, if you didn't know Jesus, you wouldn't know who it was because he was unrecognizable. They put that cross into an upright position. Proverbs 31 and 6 says that they gave strong drink unto him. That is, those that are ready to perish and wine unto those of a heavy heart. But it was a customary tradition to give a stupefying drink. Stupefying means they put it on a sponge, on a, something to suck from because you couldn't drink. You're on the cross. Now, they gave him this stupefying drink to intoxicate one, to help alleviate your suffering while you were on that cross. But I want to tell you something. Jesus refused them. So as he could suffer the full penalty for sin. Not his sin, our sin. 
sober in his right mind. Mark 15, it says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith he was numbered among the transgressors. It was now coming into fruition. Ah, yes, Lord Jesus. And the scripture tells us that Jesus looked down from the cross. Yes, Lord Jesus. He saw a very distressing scene. He saw women weeping. He saw his mother, Mary. He saw his aunt, Elizabeth, weeping. He saw Mary Magdalene weeping. He saw Roman soldiers, can I tell you, they were casting lots for his clothes. He saw criminals on each side of him, speaking, speaking to him while he hung there, while they were being crucified. Oh, my God. But thank God, this is not how the story ends. There's some good news in this text. Jesus looked up and spoke the first words spoken by him that day. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Oh my, he spoke a prayer, not retribution. A prayer in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the suffering, and all the cruel punishment. He could have called the legion of angels, but no. He gave a prayer of unmatched mercy. Yes, my brothers and sisters, a prayer of unconditional love. And as I look at my time, it's running out for me. So I'm going to cut across this field and close. Now, I have told you all about the Lamb, the Lamb of God. Jesus was the ultimate sacrificial lamb for us all. Jesus' sacrifice shows us these nine truths. One, you must sacrifice before you get your blessing. Two, there's darkness before you'll see the light. Three, you have to work before you receive your reward. A uh, four, there's humiliation before exaltation. Five, you must fight before the victory. One must fall before receiving salvation. Seven says Jesus showed the suffering before glory. Jesus saw death before life. He said, if you bear a cross, you can earn a crown. So, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Can we say thank you, God, and give God praise? Thank you. All right, all right. We, we started here. Amen. Jesus was a forgiver, wasn't it? God bless Deacon. God bless Deacon Saunders. Amen. That was a good seven minutes and 12 minutes. It was good. Praise the Lord. It was good. It was good. Now Jesus kept hanging on the cross. He just kept hanging there suffering, suffering with no madness in uh, his heart. And he said, to one of the thieves who were hanging there beside him. Today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Minister Freddie Williams is coming now. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not his benefits. We as people of God, we as children of God, we as saints of God, we have benefits. While the devil, Satan people, backsliders, and unsaved folk have fits because we win at the end. I give an honor to God and to his darling son, Jesus, who is the head of my life and whom I'm making the head of my life as I walk in the steps of a good man, which is ordained and constructed by God himself. And that man is Jesus Christ, 
the righteousness of God. I thank God for being saved and sanctified and filled and baptized with the precious Holy Ghost. You know, I thank God that I received the precious gift of the Holy Ghost and been baptized with the Holy Ghost when I did. The day spring from on high came down on me and filled me with the Holy Ghost. You know, I didn't dance. I didn't tap dance and shout. But guess what? When the Holy Ghost came in, the Lord gave me a holy dance, giving honor to our bishop. I thank God for my position. I have this perspective that God have crowned him with wisdom and knowledge to lead such a great people. And I'm honored and I'm blessed to be in his midst. And to his wife, who had the eagle eyes of intensity, that she had the spirit of discernment. Now, this is my perspective from my position. And to the first family, they could have said, me and mine and us four and no more. We're not going to share our father. Because the same thing that the pastor went through, the heartaches, the trouble, the pain, the trials, the tribulations, they probably saw him crying. I don't know, but nevertheless, God touched their hearts and said, no, we will share them. We give an honor to the elders, this illustrious elders, and to the deacons, and to the ministers who are aflame and fire. We thank God for the mothers, and let me just say this. We're going to give an honor to protocol to all those that just don't know the call. But above all that, you mean above giving honor to the bishop? Yes. To the first lady? Yes. I give an honor to my lifelong buddy bosom pal, my friend, my lover, my girlfriend, three in one, who is my wife. Thank God for you, Lord. You know, I never banged Jenga when I was in the world. I didn't call, get caught up in the lust of the flesh. I didn't mess with drugs or alcohol or nothing like that. But I was a booger and a snot. Uh-oh. Did I say booger and snot? My life was messed up and it was bagged up. It was stoled up. I'm going somewhere and I'm going to be finished in a minute. But Christ came and saved me from the bellies of hell. He brought me out of darkness, thick darkness, deep darkness, into this marvelous light. I know some of you all probably have your hand on your hip and say, I'm glad to be single. Well, I was glad too. But now I have the glad, glad down on the inside. God said that it wasn't good. And then he said it was good. And then he said it was better. He said it's not good that man, Anthropos, should be alone. So he created him a wife. And then he said that it's good that a man touch not a woman. But then he said that it is better to marry than to burn. I hope we're not burning up in here, but nevertheless, uh, this is impromptu, y'all, So, because I've been so busy. The scripture we're going to run away with is in the book of St. Luke, the great physician. You'll find these wonderful and powerful words. Then one of the criminals who were hanging blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself in us. But the other answer rebuked him, saying, Do not even, oh, excuse me, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man, this same Jesus, has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, he didn't say it plain and straight and clear like the way I'm saying it because he would die. Okay? And uh, if I could just dramatize for just a minute, he was saying, Lord, could you just remember me? Jesus said, I'll do better than that. And Jesus said unto him, or surely I say unto you, Today you will be with me in paradise. He asked the Lord to remember us, to remember him. My mother-in-law, she was 98 years old. She used to tell me, Freddie, you got your education. She didn't say education, she said education. In these new United States, but wait until you get a little money. Then the people will hear you. I find out they still won't hear you. Praise the Lord. But nevertheless, this man wanted to, Jesus to remember him. And Jesus said, I'm going to give you paradise. And what Jesus was saying here to this thief on the cross who threw the same rallying accusation in the book of St. Mark in Jesus' teeth as the other 
thief did. He was a thief. He was a roguish rogue. He was a no good. I don't think he was a petty thief. I think he was a real thief. Did everything he could do in order to get what he wanted. I see it. I like it. I want it. I'm finna get it. I'm getting ready to get it. It's mine. He didn't care if he had to get every gun in that city or spear or sword after him. He was going to get what he going to get. And uh, after he heard Jesus say it, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. This man had a change of mind, a change of heart. And he said, wait a minute here. Lord, remember me. We want the Lord to remember us, and yet we want the Lord to give us paradise. Jesus said that if you believe on me, as the scripture has said, then out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And that he spake of, of the Holy Ghost. Am I right? So here, surely Jesus said, today, not tomorrow, not some here and some by and by, not in purgatory, which is no such a thing, but today you will meet me in paradise, freedom and escape from eternal damnation. That is salvation, bliss, peace, joy, and happiness. I know you that is underneath the sound of my voice want this. You need this. In days and times that we're living in now, we got to have a savior. We need an anchor. Y'all know the song. And we better make sure that our anchor grips shallow. Glory be to the Lord. <laughs> Praise his name. And that it grips a solid rock. And that rock is Jesus. Jesus Christos. God's Christ. And that's what we got to have. Because the day is far spent, brethren. And the night is long gone. Bishop, and we're not saved. But yet we are saved. We saved to be saved. We're not saved from the very presence of sin. But we are saved from the very stain of sin. You cannot stop a bird from flying over your head and building a nest in it and raising her little chickadees. And, but you can stop her from, uh, guess what, building a nest in it. So I thank God that I'm free from the bondage of sin. I'm sanctified. I'm Holy Ghost filled. I'm fire baptized. Back at the Mount Zion Church of God in Christ there in Canton, Ohio on Shared Road, Pastor William C. Terry. You know, my homeroom teacher, she was full of the Holy Ghost. And when I joined the church, praise the Lord, uh, the Lord, the day spring from my eye, I felt the powers of the world just overshadow me. And the Lord came down in me and just filled me with new vision and new dreams and new ideas. He filled me with the Holy Ghost. And this man, right. hallelujah, was going to meet Jesus in paradise. Right. I felt like I was in paradise. in paradise. And I told the Lord, I don't want to ever leave this place. We need for the Lord to remember us. Do you want the Lord to remember you? Well, therefore, what you have to do is tell the Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me. God, I apologize. Lord, I turn from my wicked ways. Because he did say, if my people, you and I, do you follow me? Jesus was on the cross, dying not just for that thief, but he was dying for the thief and for the sins of the world. And must Jesus bear the instrument of death alone? No, there's a cross for you and I. Pray for Brother Williams. I told you I could be brief. Minister Williams, that's a good seven minutes, 11 and a half, 12 minutes, but nevertheless, we got the message. Y'all enjoying these last words coming from these fine members? Praise the name of Jesus. He just kept hanging there on Calvary's cross, he just kept hanging, waiting. And then he looked out among the crowd and he saw a woman. And he said to her, woman, behold thy son. Is Felicia Anderson come forth right behind me? Here she is. Right. I 
I'm giving honor to Bishop and uh, Evangelist Harper and all of the ministers, yeah. missionaries, mothers, saints, and friends. I hope I covered everybody. And uh, um, thank you for this opportunity to be on this um, Seven Last Words uh, program. Lord, we thank you so much for your word today. And thank you so much for the example that Jesus gave to us, Lord. Uh, may I say something that is encouraging this evening? In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, my first pastor in Atlanta loved this song. I wish I could sing, Pastor, but I can't sing. Uh, I, but this song, it, when you really stop to think about it, it says, oh, oh, sometimes, when you think about it, it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Can you imagine seeing your firstborn child be uh, crucified before your very eyes? When you stop to think about it, it definitely would make you tremble. Um, we wear crosses as a symbol of the cross, but the cross was a symbol of shame. It was like wearing an execution chair on electrocution, I should say. It's like going to Jackson and seeing somebody die. I would never, ever want to be there. But yet Mary had to see her firstborn son, her firstborn child, suffer this awful, humiliating death in front of everyone. Just think of the shame, think of the pain, think of the agony. Uh, that she must have been going through at this time. And those of you who are mothers, and even if you're not a mother and you love children, uh, this would just be the worst of the worst thing. And to think about he was innocent, to think about he didn't deserve this treatment, but yet there he was and uh, he had to hang on this cross. Now, in that day, uh, uh, we, we, didn't hear, we don't hear anything else about Joseph. So I'm assuming that by this time, Mary was a widow. And widows in that day, they didn't have Social Security, they didn't have Medicare, Medicaid, Obamacare, anything. They depended on their families to take care of them. And the firstborn in that society had a lot of responsibility, especially the firstborn son. The firstborn son was supposed to see that his family was good, was taken care of. And I, I can imagine, as people say, my sanctified imagination, I won't say that, but anyway, I can imagine that by this time in her life, Mary could see that Jesus was going to might not be the one to make sure everything was all right with her because he had a life. You know, he was around healing people and doing all these kind of things. And she had other children. But still, he had this... A burden on his heart that I'm the firstborn son. I'm supposed to see about my mother. I'm supposed to make sure that my mother is okay. And if she's not okay, that means she's going to be destitute. She's not going to have a place to stay. She's not going to have food to eat. She's not going to have a good life. And so there he is in the horrible, most horrible moment of his life. And he's thinking about the responsibility that he has. Now, that he's a good son. He's a great son. Now, some people like their mothers and some people don't. But uh, he was a good son. And um, to think about um, that, that he is doing 
what he told the Pharisees and the teachers of the law to do. They came to him and they were talking about this and that. And he said, uh, oh, did he, did they questioned him about what he and his disciples did. He said, oh, you don't follow what the scripture says that you're supposed to take care of your parents. He said, you said it's Corbin. It's, it's, it's dedicated to God. I don't have to take care of my parents. But, but he's saying, no, I'm not going to be like you. I'm not going to be irresponsible like you. Even in my worst moment, I'm going to remember the responsibility that God has given to me. And I'm going to see about my mother. And I think about it, he, as I said, he had other siblings. He could have called on some of them. But he decided to call on his buddy John. That tells you what he thought about him and the trust that he put in him. And, and you know, there's just some people, they might not, as, as my, my husband used to say, they might not have the title, but they have the testimony. Because you, you know that they're responsible people and you can depend on them. So I can see that Jesus saw that he could depend on John. And, and in a sense, he get, gave his mother up in adoption in a way and say, look, no longer, yeah, I'm going on, but now you got a new son. Now, now his children become your children. His grandchildren become your children. Um, he's, he's, she's gonna sit at your table and eat. She's gonna live at your house and be taken care of. So he, in his very, very difficult moment, thought about his mother. And I just think about my mother has been gone almost 17 years. And some of you have your parents with you, and some of you don't. But um, just think about this, that, that if you do, you still have the privilege of having your parents with you, then at least go to them and tell them thank you. At least go to them and say, I might not have money, I might not have a place to put you up, but I appreciate what you did for me. I appreciate the things that, that you taught me, the lessons that I learned at your feet. And I think that God is also calling us to think about what he's calling for us to do. E each of us has a calling. Each of us has something that Jesus is calling us to do. And you might not be able to save the whole world, but just like he called on John to see about his mother, what is he calling on you to do? Who does he want you to see about? Who does he want you to care for? Who does he want you to call on the telephone? Or maybe even just pray for, you might not be able to, to take, take, take them downtown or do whatever, but you can always pray for someone. You can always encourage them. And, and we have a lot of lonely people, especially seniors. Uh, um, like uh, everybody does, is not called to the nursing home ministry. That's a difficult ministry. But you might be called to the children, or you might be called to the teenagers, or you might be called to the men. Whatever it is that God is calling you to do, remember that you, you got, God has given you a task and you can do it and he, he will, you, you will make a difference in somebody's life just like John made a difference in Mary's life in being her, her new son. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Everybody help me. Were you there when they crucified Oh, sometimes 
It causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. profound word Jesus took the time to address his mother in a very kind and loving way from the cross then he said he cried out my God my God why has thou forsaken me Elder Marcus Reeves. <laughs> I mean, I give honor to God who's head of my life, Elder Bishop and Mother Harper, all of the elders, everybody that's here. I don't want to take your time because I know there are three more people behind me. Uh, I also honor my parents who are here and my baby Madison. I know y'all haven't seen her in a while, but she's back there probably asleep. Um, but amen, I want to go ahead and get into this. Um, Matthew 27, verse 20, uh, 46, and I'm going to read 46 and 51. And it says, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama, sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Verse 51 says, then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. Now, if I had to use for a subject on this, it would be he was there all the time. And that's really all I came to tell you, is that he was there all the time. And now by the time of our specific uh, text here, Jesus had done all he could for everybody else. He had prayed for forgiveness for the mob. He had promised a future in paradise to a monster. And he had provided fellowship to his mother. And yet, with all of his giving to others, there was no one there to give anything to him in return. He was an example of that you can give your everything to everyone and still be left without anybody giving you anything. This is why we should never give with the motive of get, giving something to get something from others in return. Because it rarely will come back when and the way that you expect it to. Nevertheless, in the moment, it was not difficult for Jesus to expect the people would forsake him. Than to accept the notion that God would have forsaken him too. He could deal with the people abandoning him because the people had already proven that they could be uh, counted on when times got rough. All right. But never could Jesus have imagined that he wouldn't feel the presence of God in the time of trouble. And after, after all, God was there when he was born. He was there when he was baptized in the River Jordan. And God was there when he healed the sick, raised the dead, fed the hungry, gave sight to the blind, unstopped deaf ears, and cast out demons. God was there all the time. But now, when he needed God the most, it appeared that God was absent and had abandoned him. So he asked, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I think it's important, people of God, that no matter how spiritual you are or you think you are, that when you feel a certain way, you ought to pray a certain way. So listen, I'm not going to paint this scene with ostentatious or grandiose words or paint this as a bed of ease. I'm going to tell God what I'm feeling at this moment. I can, I can hear Jesus doing that because right now, God, this is jacked up. This is jacked up. Right now, I don't like the situation that I'm in. God, this doesn't feel good. Right now, God, it feels like you have left me hanging, literally. <laughs> literally. And sometimes, people of God, you and I have to stop over-spiritualizing and under-humanizing everything. 
and embrace for a moment our humanity. We have to realize that sometimes it's okay to not be okay if you're really not okay. It's okay. So here, here Jesus, unlike many of us, Jesus didn't fake the moment. He didn't fake it. He kept it, like the young folks say, he kept it 100. And listen, I know, I know why some of you, <laughs> some of you can't shout on that because keeping it real or keeping it 100 is, is a difficult idea for people who like to appear as something that you're not. We think as Christians or believers of Christ, we have to be invincible to the realities that we experience all the time. But the devil is a liar. We all have flaws, troubles, and shortcomings. And the right situation will expose that ain't none of us really what we appear to be. We shout in church, but when we outside of the church, we call it problems. Some people call it problems inside the church. But. We dress up in church, but we're exposed in our community. And then to make matters worse, when we try to embrace the lie and the false idea of our invincibility, we will most likely feel our invisibility to others and ourselves. And there's nothing worse than going through pain and feeling invisible. There's nothing worse than helping everybody else. And then when you are struggling, you don't even feel like anybody see or is trying to empathize with you. This is what Jesus is at the moment. That simply means, church, you have done a good job at hiding your hurts. That's what that means. But now if you're going to get the help that you need and to be healed, you're going to have to come out, come out from wherever you are. You got, to, you got to stop hiding behind that mask. You got to stop hiding behind the titles. You got to come out from behind that self-righteousness. And you have to come out from behind that superhero complex and be healed from your disillusionment. Subsequently, for a moment, Jesus transparently processes his physical, his mental, and his spiritual pain that clearly conveys what it's like to experience detachment of our flesh from our spirit. Consider, if you will, that Jesus was slipping into death, a reality he could not control. He couldn't control that. And it's one thing to be able to recover from sickness. It's one thing to be able to rebound from a bad relationship. It's one thing to be able to repair something that's broken or to replace what you lost. But how do you deal with something with there's no way out? I'm just trying to help us to understand that death then is about losing control. And losing control will make you feel helpless and alone. It will. And I don't care who you are. Life will bring you to a point where you will realize that you are not in control. And you will sometimes wonder who is in control. Y'all don't want to be real with me tonight. But your peace will prevail when you embrace the fact that my God has everything under control. Remember, he was there all the time. That's why Paul helped us when he said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And if this earthly tabernacle will be dissolved, we have another building eternal in the heavens, not made by hand. So then my detachment it's merely deliverance and delivery to the destiny that God had already predestined me for. So Jesus helps us to see his, his detachment, but he also helps us to see the dualism within himself. Remember, he was fully God, and he was fully man. And through the cross, his God side was being separated from his man side. When he, when he who knew no sin had become sin for us. And now he has to deal with the dichotomy and the duality of himself. That obviously made him feel like he was disconnected from God. Translation. 
there's two means on the inside of me. I hope y'all get this. There's a me that's holy. Then there's a me that has the capability of being unholy. Look, at y'all don't want to agree with that because y'all... There's a me that comes to church on Sunday morning, but then there's a me that's capable of going to the club Friday and Saturday night. I'm not talking about me, y'all. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. <laughs> There's a me that will bless you in Jesus' name, but then if you rub me the wrong way, <laughs> there's a me that will forgive you, but then there's a me that will keep me up all night trying to figure out how to get you back. <laughs> y'all get where I'm going? So, but thanks be to God who prioritize his divinity over his humanity. That's why the Bible says we have to die to this flesh daily. Now, you know whatever you feed the most is what's going to be in control. So if you feed your flesh more than you feed your spirit, I'm going to go on. I'm about done. And while the split within me will make me think that God has split on me, I choose to say on the Lord's side, for he said, if I abide in him, and his word abide in me, I can ask what I will of the Father, and he'll do it for me. Yes, sir. So that sometimes the inside of me gets discouraged by the outside of me. And it feels like God has left me hanging when I'm asking him questions and nothing is being answered. But somebody here can be a witness that if you listen long enough, if you look hard enough, you will discover that God always answers prayer. I don't have enough time to really deal with this, but I want to I give you some scriptures. Okay, I'm going to give you some scriptures. Deuteronomy 31 and 8 says, He will be with you. Joshua 1 and 5, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Psalms 23 and 4, 23 and 4 For you are with me. Isaiah 41 and 10, For fear not, I am with you. Matthew 28 and 20, Lo, I am with you always. Hebrews 30, 13 and 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? I just want to tell you he didn't because he was there all the time. Elder Marcus Reese is not only a tremendous musician, but he's a preacher. Marcus act like this Sunday morning. It ain't Sunday morning. <laughs> I enjoyed it though. We thank God. We praise God. Now our singing group is coming back for a short number and then we're going to our next presenter. Thank the Lord. I'm gonna ask. Amen. That was that was wonderful. Everyone is doing well. Praise the Lord. God bless. This is a uh, corral, look like, we've got here. Thank you. 
community choir. Blessing, overflow. Thank you all. God bless you. Headed now to our last three presenters during this very sacred service, remembering the last sayings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. After hanging there for such a long time, he was both human and divine, as Elder Marcus so uh, beautifully stated. And he cried out and said, I thirst. I thirst. Mother Claudette Duncan, come in. Praise the Lord, everybody, because I do praise him tonight. I tell you, coming in here, I tripped, and I thought I was going to break something, but I didn't. But God is with, God was with me, and I thank God for Jesus. I thank him for what he is to me. I do honor our Savior, Lord, and Jesus Christ, to our leaders, Bishop Harper, Lady Harper, and each and every one of you, especially to my own husband, Pastor Sterling Duncan. Thank God for him being here tonight. I thirst. I thirst. I'm going to John 19, 28 and 30. Brother, this Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished and the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. Now there was a set of vessels on the uh, wall that they was not the best people in the world. They thought because he thirsted that they would give him some vinegar and he would be all right. But that was not the case. But what is the spiritual meaning of thirst? The more we live life seeking to be filled by the Holy Spirit, the more we will long for God and further revelation of God's character. This is known as thirst. We all thirst in our own spiritual way, in our own natural way. A lot of us, we, th we thirst for love. We th thirst for marriage. We thirst for a companion. We th thirst for money. We thirst for things. But God, what he was, what Jesus was doing, and what he mean by thirst, is Jesus' word, I thirst, may have painted not only his willingness to drink the cup of suffering for our sins and our hate, but to drink it down to the, to the very end. Given that he was nearing the end, perhaps he was painting to the fact that the cup was now nearly empty. We drink. We drink for water, we drink for anything that will soothe our thirst, but not the thirst of the Lord. We have to have God in our, in our heart and our mind to be able to carry on and do the things that God would have us to do and the things that we need to do. My soul, David said, my soul thirsts for God for the living word. He also said in Psalm 63 and 1, God, you are my God. With deepest longing, I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs and sings for you. Be a dry and weary land where there is no water. You know, God gave his life, and I thank God for giving his life for I would have so that I and we would have life. He just, he was just that kind of person. Thank God for Jesus. The phrase, I thirst, remind us again of the credible physical suffering that Jesus suffered on our behalf. He suffered for us. God put him here for us. And as we will see, there's a beautiful spiritual significance behind this phrase. But Jesus was not pretending to be thirsty. He was thirsty for the world. He was thirsty that things would go and be like they supposed to be. He really was desperately thirsty. He suffered as a real man, and this was part of him being truly human and experiencing the pain and suffering of a fallen world. And on the cross, he bared his suffering for all of us. 
He did it because God put him here to do that. What John 16 say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only, his only begotten son. And he knew that he had. He, he was human in a way because he did say, Lord, why have you forsaken me? He said, if, 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 if it's your will, I will bear this cross. But Lord knows he was a human person inside. I heard someone say they human inside and spiritual on the outside or spiritual on the inside, human on the outside. And Jesus was like that. He, didn't, he did what he was supposed to do. Uh, he knew what he, he, he was put here to do. But he still said, Lord, is this really what you want me to do? So let us, therefore, look to Christ on the cross as the one who fulfilled the scripture and let us recognize that even though Satan, the Jews, and, and the Romans, and they meant, every, they meant his death for evil, but God meant it for the greatest God in, of the world. Everything was going according to the plan, even down to the finish. Christ was not thirsty because he wanted water. He was thirsty because he wanted all of us to live and not die. God bless you. What a word, what a word. What a word. God bless you, Mother Duncan. That was so refreshing. That's a great word. Happy to see, I believe, that Mother Graham's sisters are here tonight. I, I was looking over there, Pastor Harvard members, and I'm so thankful that you all came out. God bless you all. God bless you. Thanks for coming. Then Jesus was coming down to the end. While he hanged on a cross, he was coming down to the end. Finally, he said, it is Finish of the Lord power. God bless you, and may heaven smile on you. Lord, we just ask you to let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be accepted by thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, amen. Certainly give an honor to our pastor, Bishop Harper, and to First Lady Harper on tonight. these few fleeting moments I would just like to talk to you uh, from the first John from John the 19th chapter and I need somebody to well, somebody to get for me Mark Mark 15 24 just need somebody to get that and read out loud when I when I get ready for you to read it who, who will do that for me Mark 15 24 any volunteers Okay, all right. Well, uh, John 15 and John 19 and 30. John 19 and 30. And it says, and when Jesus had received the sour wine, this is New King James, he said, it is finished and bowed his head. He gave up the ghost. Gave up the spirit, New King James says. So he said, it is finished. Uh, what is finished? And so um, the word, as they use it here, according to Strong's Greek and Hebrew dictionary, means to bring to an end. Right. The finish means to complete, to accomplish, right. to fulfill. So he's saying that I am bringing to an end, I am completing I am finishing something. And um, I'd just like to talk about how that Jesus finished the sacrificial system. And if I have enough time, I'll talk about how that he fulfills. Well, he even tells us. He tells us in the, in the 19, 19 and 28. He says, uh, uh, the verse, one of the verses Mother Duncan read, it says, and after... Uh, after Jesus knowing that all things were accomplished, uh, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. So he is fulfilling scripture. He is bringing scripture to an end or to a fulfillment.
to a completion. Uh, now, with this, this, this is a nice sanctuary, but a son, it was at one time a vision. It was somebody's vision. It was the pastor's vision. And then he told the architect, and the architect put it on paper. And so it went from a vision to being on paper to now being fulfilled. The, the, the blueprint was not the real thing. It was a picture of the real thing. And so uh, God told Moses, he told the writers to write it down. Told Moses about the, the, the sacrifices. Told Moses about the, uh, 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 told Moses about the, um, about the Passover lamb. Now the Passover lamb was not the real thing, but it was a picture of that which was to come. It was a picture of him was to come. Just like this building was a, 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 a picture uh, on the blueprint. And so, and then it came into fruition. And so uh, the Passover lamb was a picture of what was to come. And so uh, um, Jesus, Jesus is the fulfillment of scripture. He is that which was to come. Uh, who has Mark? Who has Mark? Let me slow down here a little bit. You're getting excited. Who has Mark 15 and 24? Uh huh. They parted his garments, casting lots upon them that every man should take. Okay. Uh, read, read twenty-five. Now, look, wait a minute before you do that. Let me say to get a full to get a full picture. See, Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, they they give Matthew, Mark, Luke. Uh, they're synoptic. So they, they give you, it's like a piece of a puzzle. They give you a little bit, and then he gives you a little bit, and you have to put the whole thing together. I was coming through the Stone Mountain, the city of Stone Mountain, and uh, the other day, and I saw the back of a mountain. I'd never seen that before. I just happened to look. I had been that way, but hadn't paid no attention. So the back of that mountain, it was like trees, bushes on the back, greenery. And it was like ball, and at the top it was ball, but it had greenery. They looked a whole lot different from the other side that I seen with the line, the rope going across there, and then the monuments. So I can tell you about that side, the Stone Mountain side, but it looks different. You might say, well, that's not the, what I know about Stone Mountain. You would say something different because you're looking at the mountain from a different side. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are looking at the gospel, the whole picture from a different side. But if you... Go on the mountain, if you get in a helicopter, you can see all four sides and the top. And that's why you need Moses. That's why you need the word of God to show you the top, the whole thing. And so as we piece these things together, we get a whole view of what the scripture is trying to tell us. Read 25. Read, yeah, 25. And it was the third hour, uh -huh. and they crucified It was the third hour, and they, ain't that the same thing you said? Nine o'clock in the morning? The third hour was nine o'clock in the morning. They crucified him. If you read Matthew and, 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 and Luke, it seemed like he was crucified from the sixth to the ninth hour. But then, see, they give you a part, but John is adding another part. He's showing you this. And the reason that they put this is because they're setting you up. They're trying to show you how he fulfills scripture. All right, so I'm going to show you how this is important, how he fulfills scripture. Go down to 33. And when the sixth hour was come, uh -huh. there was darkness over the whole land until uh -huh. the ninth hour. Read 37. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. Okay. Now, uh, read 25 for me one more time. I'm going to work you here. <laughs> and it was the third hour uh -huh. and they crucified him okay it was the third hour and they crucified him now why did they say this why did he say that because at the third hour remember I was going to tell you how he fulfills the sacrificial system in the morning they made a sacrifice at the third hour now there were 12 hours at night 
At sundown, that begins, that begins the first hour at night. So from, 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 from 6 o'clock at night to 6 o'clock in the morning, that's 12 hours. Then they have four watches. If you're in the Army, you had the first watch, it would be from 6 to 9. All right, so in the morning, it started at 6 o'clock. It, uh, it started the day, 12 hours in the day. Jesus said there's 12 hours in the day. And the night comes and no man can work. And so at the third hour would be 9 o'clock in the morning. At 9 o'clock in the morning, Moses commanded that a sacrifice be made, the morning sacrifice be made at 9 o'clock in the morning. So, the, so at the same time that the priest was putting to death the first sacrifice, the morning sacrifice, Jesus was being hung on the cross. Moses tells us he's putting an end to the daily sacrifice. He's put him in to the morning sacrifice. And the 33rd verse says, and when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness. The sixth hour, he gave up the ghost. Why? Because there was an evening sacrifice also. He's putting an end to the evening sacrifice. If you look in the book of Daniel, Daniel, uh, I think it's Angel Gabriel appealed, appeared to Daniel about the time of the evening oblation. Okay, so we know that was about three o'clock in, uh, um, in the afternoon. So that was the time of the evening oblation of the evening sacrifice. So remember I told you, those sacrifices were not the real thing, but they pointed to the real thing. So when Jesus was put to death at, three, at, at, three, at, uh, at the third hour, nine o'clock in the morning, Moses was signaling that he was putting an end to the morning sacrifice, to the daily sacrifice. And also daily they would bring uh, sacrifices that the, so the priest could, so the priest could, so they could be offered by the priest. Now there were five sacrifices that were offered, five sacrifices that, that they used uh, to burn on the altar of uh, uh, burnt offerings. One was the, the sin offering and the trespass offering. Paul tells us in, in Ephesians, and he alludes to, the, to that, that you, that you have he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sin. So if you know, see, we read this Bible from a Western perspective, but it was written in a Hebrew culture. And so you have to know Hebrew culture, Hebrew manners and customs to understand, to get a full understanding of what he's saying. Uh, there was a, a white guy, he, was, he, he, he went to Africa, and he had a guide, and he was walking through the bush, and the, the, uh, the guy told me, be still, be still. So he, he was be, so he just stood still. And the guy took his machete and choo, he cut a snake in half. And it was right there by his head. He said, why couldn't I see that? He said, because you don't have bush eyes. You need bush eyes. And so to understand the scripture, you need Hebrew eyes. You need to understand it from a Hebrew perspective. If you don't, you might miss something. In these few little fleeting minutes that I got. So Jesus, Jesus fulfills scripture. Even when it tells you, it don't always tell you he's fulfilling scripture, but he's fulfilling scripture. He's bringing scripture to pass, and he brings to pass the sacrificial system. There's an offering called the peace offering. Paul said he is our peace. Why did he say that? Because Jesus' death and burial and resurrection bought peace between you and God. I think Colossians tells us that, that he, um, you know, it, it, well, it says he's our peace. We have peace between him and God. He put, a, put an end. He put an end to the enmity that was between us because of his body. And so he fulfills scripture. And in these few little moments, I just want to show you, I got a nugget. If Passover was on the 15th, the 14th day. All right, you read the scripture, but John is the one that tells you, uh, Pilate said, you have a custom that I release unto you on the, on, 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 on the feast day of prisoner. And John tells us that's the Passover. So we know the Passover to be on the 14th day of Nisan. The day after that is the 15th day of Nisan, which is the feast of unleavened bread. Now on the feast of unleavened bread, you had to get all the leaven out the house. So you would get a sheet. You would get a sheet. And then you would go through the house, make sure you'd have no leaven. Now, they would make a, a final run about 3 o'clock in the evening. So about 3 o'clock in the evening, you had to go through and make sure all of the leaven was out of the house. 
and so the mother would tell the kids, look under the, look under the cabinets, look under, just, they would just be searching. So if you're a child in Hebrew custom, you were used to searching for leaven to make sure leaven was out the house. Because you couldn't have any leaven because you'd be cut off from your people. And so you would get a, get a sheet and put the leaven on there that you, that, that, that's in the house. And you would, you would wrap it up and put, put a string around it and you have a, and you know, you, you take it out outside the camp to be buried. And at the same time, they were looking for leaven and, and, and putting it into, into the sheet, into the cloth. Jesus was being, uh, he was being prepared outside the camp. They were putting, they were taking linen cloths and wrapping his body in the linen cloths. At the same time, they were putting the leaven in the cloth, getting ready for the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the first day of Feast of Unleavened Bread, the 15th day of Nisan, is a holy convocation. It's a, it's, a, it's a Sabbath. But it's not the Sabbath. It's a designated Sabbath. But you treated it as a Sabbath. And so at the same time they were doing that, they were praying Jesus' body to be, to, be, to be buried outside of the camp. And so if you look at it from Hebrew eyes, if you look at it from Hebrew eyes, Jesus fulfills the scripture. He fulfills the Passover lamb. He fulfills the scripture that talks about the feast of unleavened bread. He fulfills the scripture that talks about first fruits. Moses predicts that Jesus' death, burial, and his resurrection. And Jesus fulfilled all of those predictions. Amen. How these speakers. Now, so far, just about everybody went over their time except Mother Duncan, and I enjoyed, I enjoyed it, but this is the time for the pop-up, this is training, this is, y'all see what I'm saying? This is discipline, and I thank God everybody has been wonderful, had wonderful words, but we got to understand when we're giving a time, let's try to keep it. I preach in our last word coming and preach for our presiding bishop at that time. Bishop Blake preached at 8 o'clock, 11 o'clock. Had me in his office, that massive office at West Angeles. He said, now listen, let me give you Bishop Hopper. Say so you got 30 minutes. Now don't get excited about the response. 30 minutes for the first service, and you preach the same sermon for the second service. I did just what he asked me to do. <laughs> and the next day, that Monday night, we were in a banquet for my friend, Chris Milton, and he was the speaker, and he said, now I'm going to invite you back. <laughs> so, but we thank the Lord for these great speakers. They all had, they're excited and that's wonderful. But the last one is coming. Jesus said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Guess who's coming? Elder Xavier Williams. My mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God bless our bishop and first lady and my wife and kids and everybody in their respective places. Uh, as an adjutant, I better respect protocol so I won't get in trouble. <laughs> uh, Luke 23, verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And have saying that, he gave up the ghost. Needless to say, as Jesus is dying on the cross, he gives us the perfect example on how we should live our lives. Jesus had been beaten, chastised, spat on, mocked, slapped, scarred, berated, punished, lashes in his back, nails in his hands and in his feet, crown of thorns in his head, pierced in the side. Through all of this, he still cared enough of us to muster up the strength to give his last words. 
Again, as he is dying, he provides us with the ultimate standard on how we should live our lives. Everyone before me have spoken so eloquently, but I hope y'all don't mind me double dipping in the previous last sayings. Uh, you all can invoice me later. But again, as previously stated, Jesus first asked God to forgive the very people who turned their back on him. The same people who literally were beating and killing him which means that we need to forgive the people who have done those terrible things to us, even if it's in the midst of what we are currently going through. Secondly, Jesus decided to run an impromptu revival. Again, while he is dying, he demonstrates to all of those who are watching that it's never too late to be redeemed, restored, and saved as long as you have breath in your body. And that is the assurance that Jesus has left for us, which is no matter how far you have gone or how far your family or friends have drifted away from God, if you are still breathing, you have enough time for God to turn your life around. Jesus then makes sure that his family, his mother is taken care of, which signifies relationship and provision which means God is going to give us divine connection and he's going to take care of us. Then Jesus speaks on his physical and spiritual thirst, feeling betrayed by humanity and feeling abandoned by God. I believe that there was still a slither of hope inside of Jesus. Inside of Jesus. In that same manner, even in this uh, immoral and corrupt world, we still have a little hope in it. Jesus then shows his most vulnerable state, asking God, why hast thou forsaken me? Which means that it's okay to be human. But even in the, in the midst of his distress, he knew who to call on. Because in our distress, when we cry out to God, he's going to hear us and deliver us. And then Jesus finally says, or, or then he says, it is finished, which symbolizes the fulfillment. His work was complete. He accomplished the purpose in which he was brought on this earth to do, which means that we must accomplish the purpose that God has put us on this earth to do. And now lastly, Jesus gives us his last saying by telling God, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And once again, I want to reiterate, as Jesus is dying on the cross, he is giving us the greatest example on how we should live. If, we, if Jesus can surrender all of himself to die for us, shouldn't we be able to surrender all of ourselves to live for him? Jesus was willing to give up everything, and he was willing to sacrifice his life for us. So we should be able to give up everything for him. We need to give up the world for him. We need to sacrifice our flesh for him. We need to give up our own pleasures for him. We need to lay aside every weight that so easily beset us just for him. Because only what we do for Christ will last. We need to give our habits and our strongholds over to him. And we need to surrender our lives over to him because he died for all of us with all the sins of the world on his shoulders. Even because he was a man that knew no sin, he died with all the pain and agony in his body. He died with the nails in, hand, in his hands and in his feet. He died with the thorns in his head. He died with being pierced in his side. He died until darkness fell over the earth to the sixth to the ninth hour. He died until the sun refused to shine. He died because he loved us that much. And he also died with all power in his hands. And he didn't have to do it, but he did. And I'm glad that Isaiah said, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and we are healed. And by his stripes, we are healed. He didn't have to do it, but he did. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? And I love what the psalmist says. Jesus went to Calvary to save a ranch like you and me. They hung him high. 
they stretched him wide he hung his head for me he died but that's not how the story ends because in three days he rose again and that is love but I can take it a step further living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried our sins far away but rising he justified freeing us forever and one day he's coming back and it's going to be a glorious day he's coming back and he's going to crack the sky give your neighbor a high five and tell your neighbor one day we're going to meet him in the air and that is enough to give God praise because he didn't just die but he rose and he's coming back and I'm so glad that he's coming back for looking for a church without a spot or a wrinkle he's coming back just for us and that is how much he loves us so I dare you right now to open up your mouth and give God praise because we know that he's coming back he's coming back he's coming back and it's going to be a glorious day. The blood that Jesus, everybody standing, shed for me. Back. Help me now. Way back on that. Oh, 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 the love that gives me
him. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear. We're getting ready to pray. Falling on. Y'all know that old hymn. The Son of God discloses and, and he walked yes, he with me and he talks with me and he tells. As we carry them, none other has ever heard. Dear Heavenly Father, hiya, Shoko, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Master. Thank you, Lord, for providing us this season of reflection on your tremendous sacrifice. Thank you, Master, for suffering on the cross for our sins. Thank you, Master, for taking our place. For you did no wrong, no sin, neither there was any guile found in your mouth. But yet you came down to give your life for all of us. And we're here today to thank you. We are in reflection mode, Lord. And we are reflecting upon your tremendous sacrifice. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, help us to be more like you, Lord. Help us, oh God, to have a clear conscience, have a contrite spirit, have a clean heart, that we may serve thee in the beauty of your holiness. Lord, I pray for everyone in the sanctuary tonight. Somebody may be sick. I pray that you would touch their body now. Natural situation, touch and heal right now. Somebody may be disturbed, depressed. I pray that you would lift the heavy burdens you said for us to bring our burdens to you and leave them there. Come unto me all that are heavy laden, you said. Amen. And I will lift those burdens. Lord, I thank you for this night. I thank you for these words that have come forth one by one. They came, Lord, to remind us of the sacrifice that you made. They came tonight through your several servants, Lord, to let us know that we shall never forget what you've done for us. We shall never forget how you died. We shall never forget how you hung, bled, and died. We shall never forget the supreme sacrifice that you made on our behalf. And again, our hearts and our minds are telling you, thank you. Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. And we praise you and we glory you. Give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to leave an offering tonight before we dismiss. Praise God. I believe uh, Deacon Stanford is there. We just certainly, we can, just won't leave tonight with, without leaving. Amen. An offering. Uh, Jesus gave the supreme sacrifice then we could sacrifice an offering, and for most of us, it ain't no sacrifice. Y'all, you got so much resources. Amen. I'm looking in this section, there's so much money represented, led by Reverend Vaughn. You know, that whole section, that just money, I just see money in that section. And then I look over and in this section, uh, Somebody might say, well, money cometh, money is coming. Well, just say money is coming. I look over in this section. I don't see nothing but money. Will you stand on your wonderful sanctified feet? 
Father, bless every giver now as they come, Lord, to leave a piece of themselves. Bless this offering and the giver in Jesus' name. If you could just come from no, all over the place, here's my offering. If you have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, God bless you, Pastor Sterling Duncan, one of the best friends, one of my best friends is here. God bless you. Mother Duncan, I'm so glad you didn't fall and trip over that rug. Amen. We didn't need to be at no hospital tonight. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Oh. oh, Lord. Thank you, Deacon. Thank you, Deacon Stan. Hey, the Lord yeah, is blessing me right now. Lord, right now. I say, the Lord, put your hand together. It's blessing me. We're getting ready to go. Right now. Oh, right now. What did he do? He woke me up this morning. Started me on my way. The Lord, everybody stand. He's blessing me right now. I think Bridget got some announcement. She can announce it. The Lord, I feel like dancing. He's blessing me right now. I just had a birthday. Right now, another birthday. Ask the Lord. It's blessing me. I'm energized right now. Lord, I right feel like that. Hey, he wants me. came in the church, you know, sanctified folk. Y'all remember when we came in the church, how we used to praise the Lord? Hit it. Just thankful, y'all. You know we have to keep moving, you know. You can't. You got to keep moving. What you got to say, Bridget, about Sunday? Sunday morning. You got to say it.
See, those, see, those announcements need to have been made. All right. Thank you. God bless you all. We're ready. Yeah, yes, Mother Vaughn. That's right. Saturday, yeah. God bless you. Well, we'll be around here Saturday. I was going to Bishop Walton's wedding, but I think I'm going to just let Bishop Walton go ahead and get married. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He's only 88, I think. <laughs> Bishop Walton said he needed a wife. And he got one. <laughs> so let's, let's pray for Dad Walton. He's getting married. He's getting hitched. Jumping the broom on Saturday. Amen. We thank God for him. Happy for him, too. Amen. Well, we thank God for you, and we're ready to go. Let us pray out this. I want to thank again each one of these speakers. They blessed us, didn't they? I love them. Amen. Praise God. Rich, rich, rich. Now, God, we just thank you for another seven last sand service one that we've been having for over 30 years, and you've never disappointed us. We thank you for every speaker, presenter that came before us tonight. I pray that you will continue to anoint them to do great exploits for you and great works for you. You say it in your word, the works that you do, greater works that we are to do. Bless us now, Lord, as we prepare to go. And Lord, for the furthering of this uh, Easter month, week, we pray that the service on Sunday, our 9 o'clock Easter program will be a great success and it will inspire many. We pray that Sunday morning at 1030 we'll also have a wonderful service. Bless us now as we leave this place. Keep our cars on the highways and byways. Dismiss us from this holy temple, not from your divine presence. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.